Hi, this is Ron Najafi. I'm CEO of Emory Pharma. Uh, in our next video, we're doing something exciting. We're taking material that's already on our YouTube channel, on our website, that are fact-based, science-based, and we're using an AI tool to break it down into an understandable, bite-sized manner that's engaging and hopefully will enhance your understanding. I hope you enjoy it. Today we're getting into something pretty fundamental, uh, the really surprising and, well, complex relationship between sugar, our metabolic health, and also this whole idea of personal responsibility. Exactly. And it's worth mentioning straight away, some of the really key ideas we'll be discussing actually came up in a, uh, a presentation Professor Robert Lustig gave recently at Emory Pharma. That really got us thinking. It did. So our mission here is to kind of cut through the noise, you know, yeah. to really understand the actual impact sugar has. Yeah, we'll be looking at a whole range of stuff. Big studies from the NIH, Professor Lustig's lecture insights, um, specific research on fructose in the liver. And that study showing benefits when sugar was cut for kids, plus the whole history with the sugar industry's influence and even uh, links to mental health. Right. It's quite a mix. Okay, so let's start with something that might really shift how you think about long-term health, the impact of sugar exposure early in life. There was this fascinating NIH-funded study looking at the UK's sugar rationing after World War II. Mm -hmm. It was basically a perfect natural experiment, wasn't it? Because mm -hmm. you had this period of really tight rationing, and then suddenly sugar was everywhere again. So what did they do? Well, researchers... Uh, like Dr. Grackner from USC, they looked at health data from over 60,000 people born between 51 and 56 using the UK Biobank data. It's a huge data set. And the findings. Pretty striking. Longer exposure to that rationing, especially in the womb and up to age two, was linked to a significantly lower risk of diabetes decades later, like 35% lower. Wow, 35%. That's huge. It is. And about 20% lower risk for hypertension, too. It's so like that early period acted as a kind of metabolic shield for them later in life. So less sugar early on meant less disease much, much later. Yeah. And even the age they got diagnosed was later. On average, four years later for diabetes and two years later for hypertension compared to people who never had that rationing period. Incredible. Even just in the womb made some difference. It seemed to offer some protection. Yeah. Though maybe not quite as strong as that early childhood period. Dr. Grackner really pointed out how hard it normally is to study these long-term effects of added sugar, you know? Right, you can't exactly run a decades-long randomized trial like that. Exactly. So this natural experiment was invaluable. And Dr. Jane at the NIH said, it just highlights how powerfully that early environment shapes our health trajectory. It has this sort of outsized impact. Okay, that really sets the stage. Now let's tackle that big, common idea the simple calories in, calories out model for weight. Yes. Professor Lustig, in that Emory Pharma talk, really went straight at this. He basically said, everything you thought you knew about obesity is wrong. Strong statement. Definitely. He talked about this concept, uh, agnotology. Agnotology. Yeah, it's the study of culturally induced ignorance. Yeah. Like how sometimes confusion or doubt is deliberately created, especially around public health issues. Think tobacco industry sowing doubt about smoking risks. Okay, I see. So the idea is that the focus on personal responsibility for obesity, you know, blaming it all on eating too much or being lazy, might actually be a form of this induced ignorance. That's the argument he was making. He pointed out that this framing has been dominant for a long time, but then he presented some counter evidence that makes you pause. Like what? Well, for instance, the average body temperature in the U.S. population has actually dropped over the last 150 years. Dropped. So we're burning less energy. That's the suggestion. And think about this. Lots of different types of captive animals, zoo animals, lab animals, they've been getting heavier over the last 25 years or so. Even though their diets and environments are controlled. Exactly. They're not choosing pizza over salad. It suggests something else is going on systemically. Huh. And you mentioned kids, too. Yeah. His point was no child chooses to be obese. And it's a global epidemic affecting almost every country. Even babies are being born fatter now. Right. So putting all that together, he argues it's really not just about calories. It points towards a deeper biochemical problem. And he also talked about people who look thin but are metabolically unhealthy, right? Yes. That's a crucial point. A huge percentage of people with a normal BMI actually have the same metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, risk factors, 
high triglyceride as people with obesity. What kind of percentage are we talking? He cited a figure that something like 93% of Americans show some sign of metabolic dysfunction. 93%. That's almost everyone. It's staggering, isn't it? Yeah. It, it really makes you question if just telling people to eat less, move more is the whole story. He also made the distinction between subcutaneous fat, the stuff just under your skin. Yeah, the pinchable stuff. Right. And visceral fat, the fat deep inside around your organs. Mm. That visceral fat is the really metabolically active, problematic kind. Okay. So if it's not just calories, what is driving this biochemically? This brings us to fructose, I suppose. Exactly. There's a lot of research focusing specifically on fructose, like in that fructose in the liver article we looked at. Yeah. It really breaks down how our bodies handle it differently. So what's the key takeaway there? The main thing is that your liver does most of the heavy listing with fructose. About 70% of it gets processed there. Okay. And when you flood the liver with a lot of fructose, it basically switches on fat production mode. It starts churning out fatty acids and triglycerides accumulate in the liver. Ah, so the liver itself starts getting fatty. Yes, that's a major part of it. Yeah. A process called hepatic de novo lipogenesis, basically making new fat right there in the liver. The article gets into the weeds, you know, fructose to fructose, one phosphate via KHKC, then feeding into pathways that make triacylglycerols and VLDL. VLDL, that's the bad cholesterol stuff, partly. Well, it transports fats. High levels aren't good. Fructose also seems to boost the expression of SREBP1C, which is like a master regulator for fat production in the liver. So it's really pushing the liver towards making and storing fat? Pretty much. And the consequences are things like hypertriglyceridemia, high triglycerides floating around in your blood, and just generally increased fat synthesis by the liver. And it's not just fat, is it? Didn't it mention uric acid too? Good point, yeah. Fructose metabolism can also increase uric acid production, which has its own links to metabolic issues like gout and potentially hypertension. Plus, it can cause oxidative stress in the liver cells. And the gut connection. Right. There's emerging evidence that high fructose intake can change your gut microbiome, the balance of bacteria in your gut. How did that play out? Well, it might make the gut lining leakier, allowing sort of toxic bacterial bits to get through to the liver potentially promoting inflammation and conditions like NHH, non-alcoholic hepatitis. Wow. Okay, so fructose seems to have these really specific, potentially damaging effects, especially on the liver, that aren't just about its calorie count. That's the core idea, yeah. Which leads really nicely into that UCSF study you mentioned earlier, the one with obese kids. Right, the one where they cut sugar but not calories. Tell us about that. So... They took obese children who already had signs of metabolic syndrome, things like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, unhealthy cholesterol levels. Uh and for just nine days, they changed their diet. They specifically reduced the added sugar content significantly. But, and this is the clever bit, they replaced those sugar calories with calories from starch, things like bagels, pasta, cereal. So same total calories, same fat, protein, carbs overall, just swapping sugar for starch. Exactly. They kept the macronutrients and total calories consistent with the kids' usual diets. The only major change was the source of the carbs, less sugar, more starch. And what happened in only nine days? The results were pretty dramatic, honestly. They saw significant drops in diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides went down, LDL cholesterol, the bad kind improved, Liver function tests got better. Wow. Fasting blood glucose fell. Insulin levels dropped substantially. And crucially, this all happened without any significant change in the kid's weight. No weight change, but all those health markers improved. In just nine days. It's quite remarkable. So that really supports the idea that sugar itself is doing something metabolically, separate from just its calories causing weight gain. Absolutely. Dr. Lustig, who led that study, put it very directly. He said, this study definitively shows that sugar is metabolically harmful, not because of its calories or its effects on weight. Rather, sugar is metabolically harmful because it's sugar. A calorie is not a calorie, then. That's the inescapable conclusion from this kind of research, isn't it? The source really, really matters for your metabolism. Okay, this narrative of sugar as toxic, or at least uniquely harmful, where did the opposite idea that fat was the main enemy come from. This takes us into that historical analysis, right? It does. And it's, well, it's quite revealing. We looked at that analysis of internal documents from the Sugar Research Foundation, the SRF, back in the day. The sugar industry's own group. Right. And it seems that back in the 1960s, they made some pretty strategic moves. They funded research, including a big literature review published in a major journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. And the goal? According to the analysis of their internal documents, 
The goal was clearly to downplay the risks of sucrose table sugar and shift the blame for coronary heart disease firmly onto dietary fat, particularly saturated fat. So they paid for research to make sugar look better and fat look worse. That appears to be the case. What's really eyebrow raising is how involved they were. The SRF apparently set the review's objectives. They suggested articles to include. They reviewed drafts before publication. And did they disclose this funding and involvement? The analysis suggests they did not. Their funding and role weren't made clear in the final publication, which definitely raises red flags about conflict of interest. Why were they so keen to blame fat? Well, think about it. Okay. If people are told to eat low fat, what often happens, they tend to eat more carbohydrates, including sugar, right? So promoting a low fat message could actually boost sugar sales. Ah, a market share strategy. Seems likely. The documents also show they were getting worried about research that was linking sugar to heart disease, especially work by a British scientist named John Yudkin. So they funded their own counter research. They funded something called Project 226 which was specifically designed to produce this literature review to refute the claims about sugar's dangers. And did the review completely ignore the evidence against sugar? Not entirely. It acknowledged some links in population studies and some lab evidence about sugar raising cholesterol and triglycerides. But the analysis suggests it selectively presented findings, especially from clinical trials, to ultimately conclude that fat was the main dietary issue for heart disease, effectively minimizing the concerns about sugar. So the takeaway is the industry actively tried to shape the scientific narrative to protect its product. That's what the historical analysis strongly indicates. It's a sobering reminder about how financial interests can potentially influence scientific consensus and public health guidance. Absolutely. Always need to look at who funded the research. Okay, let's bring this back to the present and Professor Lustig's broader points from his lecture. Right. He connected that history to the modern emphasis on personal responsibility. He actually drew a line from how the tobacco industry used the assumption of risk defense in lawsuits. Meaning people know it's risky but choose to smoke anyway. Yeah, shifting blame to the individual. He suggested a similar dynamic might be at play with obesity and metabolic disease. He also mentioned a psychological term, alexithymia. Yes, alexithymia. He described it as sort of a difficulty in recognizing or describing emotions, potentially leading to a lack of empathy. He proposed this might manifest as blaming individuals for health problems rather than considering, you know, the complex biochemical and societal factors. So tying it all together, his argument is that biochemistry heavily influences behavior, right? Which challenges putting all the focus on individual willpower. Precisely. He made the point that we don't solve complex issues like substance abuse or addiction just through education alone. People often know something is bad for them, but struggle to change behavior for deep-seated reasons. Which implies we need more than just telling people to make better choices. Exactly. It suggests a need for broader public health interventions, changes to the food environment, societal shifts things that make the healthier choice the easier choice, perhaps alongside empowering individuals. It can't just be about blaming the person. And there was that quick mention of a ketogenic diet study. How does that fit in? Yeah, just briefly, a pilot study showed that using a very low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet actually led to improvements in people with severe mental illness. Intriguingly, it also often reversed their obesity and metabolic syndrome at the same time. So a potential link between metabolic health and mental health. It certainly hints at a deeper connection there, further complicating that simple narrative of just personal responsibility for either physical or mental health issues. It suggests metabolism might play a role we're only beginning to understand in brain function too. Okay, so wrapping this all up, what are the main things you want people to take away from this steep dive? Well, I think there are a few really key things. First, that early life environment, especially sugar exposure, seems to cast a really long shadow on our future metabolic health. Right, the rationing studies showed that clearly. Second, sugar's impact is definitely more complicated than just its calories. The type of calorie matters, and fructose seems to have unique effects, particularly on the liver. Uh-huh. The UCSF Kids study really highlighted that. Third, the whole narrative around sugar, fat, and personal responsibility has this complex and frankly sometimes troubling history with industry influence playing a significant role. Which brings us back to where we started with Professor Lustig's talks, like at Emory Pharma, really pushing us to rethink our whole framework for understanding metabolic health. Absolutely. It challenges the status quo. So maybe the final thought for you listening is this. Given everything we've discussed, the biochemical power of sugar, the historical shaping of dietary advice, 
how do we strike the right balance? How much is individual choice and how much needs broader societal change to really create a healthier future for everyone? It's a big question, isn't it? Definitely worth thinking more about and digging into the research we touched on today. There's a lot more complexity there.